Look, I know this is typecasting a little bit, and I know he's a very versatile and excellent actor, but any time that I see Callum Keith Renee in anything, I can never stop thinking of him as the creeper Cylon from Battlestar Galactica. I'm sorry, he was such a good creeper, I can't unthink it. <laughs> Interwebs, I hope you're all doing well because I am pumped and a little bittersweetly saddened to finally be able to review the premiere episode of the fifth and final season of Star Trek Discovery, this episode titled The Red Directive. It has been a long road since we last saw Star Trek Discovery at the end of season four. There's been a bunch of other Star Trek shows that have premiered and even ended, like Star Trek Picard. We also got the announcement that this was going to be the final season of Discovery, something that surprised apparently even the cast and crew of Discovery, considering they had to refilm the ending of this season. So it's just been a lot going on, and I, and like I said, I am really kind of saddened that this is the final season because. Even though Star Trek Discovery has had many flaws over its five years, I have really come to love the show for so much that has added to the tapestry of what Star Trek is. So much so that if you have not watched it, I actually have been doing retro reviews of Star Trek Discovery's first season that recently uh, finished a few days ago. So check those out because I'm actually really proud of those reviews. I went over a lot of the themes and ideas and concepts that went into Discovery's first season. So please check those out because those did not get the views that I was really hoping for. But regardless, I am very pumped to finally be back in the world of Discovery, even if it is going to be for one last ride. So let us talk about this season premiere. And just to note, this was actually a double premiere with this episode coming alongside the second episode of the season, which I will be reviewing in a completely different video. So be on the lookout for that coming in just a few more hours later today if you're watching this video when it goes up. But we are just going to stick to the premiere episode here. And as per usual, I will stay spoiler free for a couple minutes and then I will give a warning and go into full spoilers and beat by beat break down the rest of the episode. So. Staying spoiler free, what did I think of this premiere? I thought it was a very, very strong premiere that set us up on a really fun, kind of different ride for uh, Star Trek Discovery that I hope stays on this track because it feels like a distinct different flavor than we've gotten from any of the other four seasons of Discovery and feels like something kind of fresh in terms of the style of Star Trek shows that we've been getting, especially the more serialized Star Trek shows like Discovery has been and also Star Trek Picard has been. And that mainly centers around the fact that this premiere is setting us up on a sort of Indiana Jones style treasure hunt for the rest of the season. Now, I won't spoil what the treasure hunt is over as we do get some little hints at that in this episode that are coming towards the end. But what I will say is that this episode really does capture that kind of treasure hunting Indiana Jones. We're gonna go on an adventure and go to different locales and try to understand like different puzzles and uncover ancient artifacts sort of vibe that you get from those style of films. And I think it really does it rather well. It kind of captures all those different tropes, all those different like, you know, location hopping bits just in this episode. And I frankly kind of hope that we continue this thread uh, for the entire season because as I said, usually Star Trek Discovery has these sort of big like universe ending stakes or like big mysteries that kind of go deep into these dark rabbit holes or uh, war and, and themes of fascism and things like that throughout all of its series. And here, uh, this is still has a mystery box, even quite literally, but just has like a fresh sort of fun feel to it. And while the stakes do have uh, some hints towards larger implications for the entire universe, which I always get kind of frustrated with Star Trek always relying on universe ending stakes all the time that I'm hoping this season doesn't get too deep into. I do think that this sort of fresh fun feel is is really uh, a great time. And that mainly also comes off the back of our central antagonists here, Maul and Locke. Played by the wonderful Eve Harlow and Elias Truffaut, uh, who many people may know from his appearance in the third episode of Star Trek Discovery, playing a completely different character and a human uh, in that episode as well. So it's nice to see him back in Star Trek here, because he seems like a really chill and cool dude from all his interviews that he's been giving for this season. And those two give a really Bonnie and Clyde feel that I'm excited to see explored as this season goes out. And they do feel really fresh. They don't kind of have this like villainous mustache twirling sort of vibe like Empress George O or even Lorca as we got into season one or some of the other villains that we've had uh, throughout this series so far. But they just have, have this sort of like smuggler vibe that kind of feels like a fresh take as antagonist to our Discovery crew. So I'm really enjoying their dynamic and I hope we get more of them because we didn't get a ton of them in this episode. 
But most importantly to me, this episode does bring back all of my favorite Star Trek Discovery characters and sets them off on really good trajectories. I, what I really love Discovery for is the sense of family that it really has that feels uh, almost as closely akin to the Next Generation style crew. Uh, just all the actors and characters just really feel like they love and care for each other and those come out in like the really wonderful moments here in this episode. And frankly, the moments that I really love are the small moments between these characters uh, that get to shine despite some of the larger goals goings on in this episode that I found really, really fun. The one major negative, though, that I will give to Discovery, and this is kind of a problem with a lot of Star Trek uh, nowadays, but I think is really crystallized here for me, is that the action sequences in this episode, of which there are two, are beautiful on a CGI level and sort of spectacle level, but also, frankly, don't really ever draw me in or make me feel the stakes and feel a little bit weightless because they never really give me a sense of scale and geography of the situation. So we kind of get a lot of narrating what's going on by the characters rather than me really feeling enthralled and enveloped by the action. And I really feel that very much so with this episode, especially in the second action sequence we get here because, and I'll get into the nitty gritty of it in just a little bit, but it just, I just never feel like I'm involved in anything. It just fairly clearly feels like they're on a CGI set narrating a lot of the things that are happening without me really like getting to fully grasp the stakes or the situation or what's happening. And I found to be rather disappointing uh, and, and really crystallizing that problem that I think is an ongoing one for a lot of Star Trek past, I think, Discovery's first season, because I think its first season did have some solid action beats, but after that season it kind of has fallen apart, and that's again goes into Picard and other Star Trek shows as well. I'll talk a little bit more about him in spoilers, but we also get an introduction to an interesting new character with Captain Rayner, who I think will be an interesting, I don't want to say antagonist, but perhaps a complicating uh, character, uh, or even anti-hero character that we get throughout this season, so pumped to talk about him. Overall, I think this is a strong season premiere that sets us off on a really interesting mystery that I, I am worried will go into the normal, you know, all universe uh, ending life stakes stuff that Star Trek tends to get into, but right now feels like a fun Indiana Jones style mystery. But with all that said, let's get into spoilers so I can talk more deeply about it. Alrighty, everybody, now we're in the spoiler section where all the cool kids hang out, so we can talk about whatever we want. I can say, I can say anything at this point. Oh, look, this season. But uh, yeah, I can say whatever I want now because I'm cool like that. All right, as per usual, I'm going to go through the episode beat by beat, and we'll just sort of talk about stuff that I found interesting as we get through the episode. We do start off the episode with sort of a in-media res thing where we get to see one of the action beats later on and then jump back in time. Not much, to, I don't have much to say about that other than I did really like the sort of aggressive looking warp bubble that we got for uh, Maul and Locke's ship in that opening, which is kind of a cool visualization of warp. I always love seeing different types of warp for different ships, uh, and this one was just a rather cool one. But then we do jump back in time to Federation HQ and our crew at a party celebrating the millennium anniversary of uh, the Federation, give or take a few decades, because you know uh, the burn, well, the burn kind of screwed up some timelines a little bit. So we're just, we'll just say it's the millennium celebration, just because we want to have a party. That's kind of the vibe that I got from here. It's like, ah, eh, we want to have a party. It's fine. Don't worry about dates too much. It's the burn screwed stuff up. And I will say, I adored this entire sequence despite how short it was. We don't really get many chances to just spend downtime with our Discovery characters because the show has so few episodes and it's always like move, 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 moving. Uh, so I, I just like when we get to see these moments of just these characters chilling, hanging out, being friends. Uh, I wish we had got more of that like we got in shows like Next Generation or even Deep Space Nine and Voyager way back in the day. But again, we live in the streaming era. We don't have as much time, so I will cherish the little pieces that I get. But I just love the back and forth here. Them just sort of joking about the... Uh, the uh, Andorian drinks was wonderful. And I want one of those. I want to pop the bubble. It looks so satisfying, like little stars. I really hope they serve that on like the Star Trek cruise. I'm planning on going on the Star Trek cruise next year for the first time, pumped about that. So I hope they serve that there because that just looked too like too much fun uh, to not drink. Uh, I also really love Tilly, kind of like maybe uh, getting a little side action with the boyfriend guy. We'll talk about him more in a little bit. But I was like, ah, oh, Tilly, look at you. You having some fun at the party. Uh, and then uh, Burnham sort of being like, ah, oh, Duty calls. I gotta go hang out with the the delegates. Oh God, I gotta deal with that. It's like I've I've I have been that professional at a party, networking party before. So it's just Burnham being like, oh, I just want to hang out with my friends. We also get set up in these scenes uh, two sort of character beats uh, for our characters throughout the season. The first of which is uh, we learn that Stemets is kind of perturbed by the fact that the spore drive has been retired. That they're not going to make any more of them. Which again weirds me out. I understand that like stuff with book ship last season sort of made it harder 
but it's like this is the same thing I had with like way back in the 23rd century with the spore drive it's like this is such a game-changing technology why are they just like eh we'll stop researching that we got the discovery. It's fine. It's no big deal. Uh, it's it just sort of like one of those like trying not to give the Federation too much power because uh, otherwise if they had the discovery spore drive chip on all of their ships, uh, it would be uh, ridiculously overpowered as a political power. So I think the show being, especially since we're going to get the spinoff Starfleet Academy in the 32nd century very soon, uh, I imagine them just having all sport drives would be like, well, the Federation just is going to own everybody at this point. Um, so it is a little bit of yada 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 But it does lead to an interesting moment with Stemets, uh, because he is sort of wondering, like, well, what am I going to do now? What's my legacy? The spore drive was supposed to be this thing that I was going to leave for the future as a scientist, and now I don't really have that, so what am I leaving behind? And what what can I work on next? What's my purpose? What can I find to do? Um, and I think that that's an interesting setup for his arc this entire season, and we'll see where that goes. The other arc that we get set up here, and I adore it so much, they're so adorable, is Saru and uh, the Vulcan president, or sorry, the Navari president, uh, Tarin. Uh, and I love her like flirting with Saru in a Vulcan way. It's like, do I have to conduct a mind meld to see what's going on in your head? adorable. I love these two so much. They're so cute. And we learn that Saru is debating to, um, retiring from Starfleet in order to take an ambassador role, which he doesn't want to do because he loves Discovery, but also cares about Tarina and it would bring him closer to her. And Tarina's like, no, I'm a Vulcan, like, focus on the professionalism. But obviously, we're, Saru's our little emotional little Kelpian guy, and he wants to think about his girlfriend. So we'll get that arc set up throughout this episode here as well. But very quickly, Vance comes up to Burnham and hands her a little weird infinity symbol thing saying that it's a red directive. And I'm always just like, why do, the, why, why do these secret like organizations or groups or directives within Starfleet always have these logos? Like we had the Section 31 black badge in Star Trek Discovery. Um, but also way back in Voyager, we had the Omega directive, which like put this Omega symbol in front of everyone's screen. And I'm just like, oh, well, look, I get it. The graphic designers working at Starfleet want to make their graphics or whatever. But like, if it's a secret organization stop making little like oh look here we made a cool little infinity badge for our secret thing or we made a little cool little logo for our secret directive that no one's supposed to know about it's like come on guys stop that no bad move isn't section 31 supposed to be like a big secret i mean why would we wear special com badges that advertise who we are you could still be dead but we do go into Kovic's Infinity Room, which reminded me of the uh, invisible paint stuff from the uh, animated series or comic book series uh, Invincible. If you've been watching those, it kind of gave me the same exact vibes. But uh, Kovic says there's a red directive. They need to go and find this 800-year-old Romulan ship, which then sets that ship uh, from being around the next generation, Deep Space Nine era, or just after, to find some sort of uh, artifact that is on this ship that they need immediately. It is vital to the security of the Federation, so we've got our stakes set here. We then get a quick sequence of what I like to call the USS Discovery professionalism moment that happens in a bunch of Star Trek Discovery premieres, like they did it in Season 2 and Season 4, where we just get these moments of the Discovery crew just being really efficient uh, Starfleet crew members. Always love to see it. But then we go and meet Maul and Locke, who arrive at the Romulan ship before the Discovery crew to find this artifact, because they have also learned about it at the same time. Again, I really like these two. We don't get a ton of them this episode, but their interactions do speak to a little bit of that Bonnie and Clyde vibe and I hope we get to learn more about them because both actors are a lot of fun their look is a lot of fun and I feel like if given the chance they could be some really cool fun antagonists for our show this season um, so I hope they don't remain as serious as they are in this episode we get a little bit more uh, exciting feeling and a banter between the two of them but what we saw here in this episode considering how fast it moved I thought was really solid Kovic then sends Burnham and the crew over to the Romulan ship, and uh, Kovic is being kind of bloodthirsty here. He's like, I don't care what happens to those people. We need this information. Murder them now. Uh, which I just, I'm very curious. I really hope we get this season more information about Kovic, uh, because we've just, we, he's been such a big mystery for this entire show of like where he fits within the Federation world. What's his job? It's even above Vance, because we even get sense this episode that like Vance doesn't really know what Kovic is. So I just, I really hope we get some more info and dive into Kovic's backstory somehow this season because he's just so much of a question mark that I just really want to know. Especially since I really love him. David Cronenberg does such a great job with Kovic. I, I just have fun with him. Reese, Oo, and Burnham jump over to the Romulan ship, and I really wish we got more to see with Oo and Reese. This again, this is a common Star Trek Discovery complaint where I wish we got more of the bridge crew uh, having personalities here that just sort of back up to Burnham. Uh, but it's nice to see them get to you know get off the bridge a little bit. But we also get Zombielins, you know, zombie. 
Romulans. We get a we get a zombie. Rom okay, it's not really a zombie. He's just a dead Romulan. But I, I came up with the term Zombulan in my notes, and I just wanted to use the term Zombulan. Okay, uh, sue me. Don't sue me, please. I don't have a lot of money. But our Starfleet crew does eventually run into Maul and Locke, who have found the artifact before they did, and Maul and Locke get to escape. A few things here before we get to the action sequence in a bit. I did really enjoy that Maul and Locke use these force field prison things for Owo and Detmer. Kind of shows that they aren't trying to kill anybody, they're willing to kill people, but they do try to use non-lethal things uh, first, and I thought that was like a clever uh, weapon that I've never seen before in Star Trek. And we also get their like black hole machine that like makes a hole in the floor uh, that Burnham falls through and then lands on their ship, which I also thought was very, very cool. But this does bring us to the action sequence and one of my biggest uh, criticisms of this episode overall, as I talked about in my spoiler-free section, which is, it was just hard to get a, invested in the stakes of this sequence, mostly because so many different elements were introduced and they weren't given like proper weight, like some of them even were happening in the background, that I just never really kind of understood exactly what was happening and as a result never got fully invested. Like I understood enough what was going on that I wasn't like confused, but it was just a lot of noise that prevented me from really getting like super involved in that. For example, my biggest one that I have is we get during this sequence the introduction of Captain Rayner and his ship. And I didn't even catch the name of his ship really at all, uh, but he sort of just, his ship comes in and starts tractoring Maul and Locke's ship, and, and, and we hear his voice, and while we do get an introduction to his character in a little bit after this sequence, it just felt like a really weird way to introduce him, where he just comes in in the middle of the sequence, it's just his voice, we don't get to see him in any way, shape, or form, maybe on his bridge or something, and his ship kind of comes in in the background out of nowhere. It, it just was an element that just came, I was like, wait, what? what's happening? And I had even seen this uh, sequence at Comic-Con, because I was at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con, uh, earlier last year. And I was confused when I watched this sequence at Comic-Con, because I'm like, whoa, that ship just comes out of nowhere. And I figured, oh, they must have introduced it early in the episode, we just don't get to, to see it yet, because we're just watching an isolated clip here. But no, this is where it's introduced, and I was still just as confused for a little bit. The other thing I was uh, sort of confused by was Burnham shooting their ship. I get that she's shooting it to stop them from going places, but again, and this will be a bigger problem in the second action sequence here, is there's a lot of narrating to us what is happening. So Burnham's saying, oh, I'm shooting the warp drive or whatever, rather than me getting a real concrete sense of like, what is she shooting? What is she trying to hit? Like, there could have just been more given to like maybe close-ups of what she's shooting at. Uh, or maybe she's trying to do like some delicate procedure with the phaser while the ship's going on. That would have been a lot more fun too, to like, I have to cut like this wire and this wire and be very careful while I'm also arguing with everybody. Like that would have added more tension and more specifics, but instead it's just Burnham just randomly shooting the, the ship ran for like five minutes uh, without real any sense of what exactly she's trying to get done other than just vague techno babble that gets spouted at us. But I will say the sequence does end in a cool way where after Burnham fights with Rainer to get him to remove the tractor beam on Maul and Locke's ship, they escape by sending out some different warp signals that I thought was a cool visual. And also the visual of Burnham like teleporting through the view screen uh, and then sitting down in her chair like a badass was awesome. So I will give some like badass points to Burnham uh, for the end of this sequence. I also love during the action sequence too that Kovich was very clearly like not getting his sea legs on the Discovery, uh, which I thought was uh, was also kind of adorable. Perhaps you'd be more comfortable in the ready room. I'll be perfectly comfortable when you completed your mission. As you wish. But here's where we get our first official introduction to Captain Rayner, played by, again, as I mentioned before in my opening joke, Callan Keith Renee, a Battlestar Galactica alum. Love to see him. He is playing one of the Kelly Runs, uh, who are an alien from Deep Space Nine's episode Armageddon Game. So that was a fun little deep cut to see there. Uh, and just, I, I love this actor. He is really, really great. I, I think he's a fun time. And he just seems like he's playing a uh, big asshole, which, uh, you know, I think he will play very, very well. I, I, and the reason that I think he plays an asshole very well is because because while he is an asshole, he does have this sense of charm to him that the actor brings. So while I am feeling like I'm not supposed to like Rainer, there's a little bit of element of like, but he does have a little bit of that sort of uh, friendliness to him that we get in different sequences and moments that prevent me from fully getting annoyed and hating his character, which I think will be uh, an interesting relationship with him as if, if he comes back in future episodes. 
But then Burnham calls in Book to help with their mission, and I, I, I'm i so glad that Book is still here in this season. I was worried that he would be shipped off after the end of last season where he was sent off to do restorative justice punishment uh, and help those that he had caused harm to last season. So I'm glad that he's back here, and we get the sense that the two of them, Burnham and Book, uh, are on the outs a little bit, that they haven't really talked to each other, which I think is an interesting place with their relationship because I really love these two. I think their chemistry is amazing, certainly much more than Ash Tyler has with Burnham, uh, and I really hope by the end of the season they end up together. I, I, I am very much a shipper of these two. Also because, like, they are two of the most beautiful people that I've ever seen in my life, so I'm just I'm just here for that. Um, but uh, we get that. Also, a little sidetrack here. While they're walking and talking, a Tribble is in the background of the Discovery ship. This is something they did in the Season 4 premiere as well, with a Tribble just on the ship. Whoa, what's with the random Tribble? I, I get it. We want our little Star Trek Easter eggs, but, like, no. No bueno. Tribble's bad. Unless it's, like, Lorca's neutered Tribble from Season 1. Has that just been floating around the ship for five seasons? Now I'm curious about that. We also get a quick little sequence with uh, Burnham and Saru worrying about what their Red Directive is all about and them thinking of calling Tilly to get in on all of this. I also love this sequence because it just shows Burnham caring about Saru and, and would, saying she would miss him if he left. And I, I just, again, I love their friendship. I love these small moments between our characters to just show how much they've grown to care about each other and become a family over this uh, entire series. Uh, especially considering where these two started way back in season one. So I, I just love this moment of caring between these two. But we do jump over to Tilly uh, being drunk and bringing a boy back to her room. It's a funny little sequence uh, where it's very clear that this guy like is like, yeah, we want, is, it, is it hot in here? Do we need to take off our clothes? No? Okay, cool. And I do like that it's a sequence of a guy being like, are we gonna bone? We gonna bone? No? Cool. I'm just gonna leave. No no hard feelings. Uh, and and uh, you just don't get to see that often, especially in science fiction of just like a guy and a girl like going back, but then saying like, no, it's cool. And the guy being like, that's that's cool. I was down. To, I was down to clown, but you know, down to clown. That's how I talk about sex. Uh, I was down to bone, uh, and but you know, if not, cool, totally fine. Um, and then Tilly having that face of like. Yeah, like that that was, I I, under, I I registered every beat in her head for that and that was wonderful. But I liked her uh, getting a drunk call from Burnham and being like, I am in, uh, no matter what, to help out here. Uh, I'll also jump to the next sequence here where she is interrupted by uh, the Starfleet security, but then Vance sort of sends them away. And I love Vance being like, look, I want to know too. I don't know what the hell's going on. Too bad I didn't catch you uh, before you, you went through with the, the algorithm that I will help you press uh, and then figuring out some more information about what's going on with the Red Directive uh, to give Burnham a little bit of an edge to go to Kovich with towards the end of this episode. So uh, I loved uh, all of that on a character level. That was a lot of fun. But then Book then narrows down the search to the planet Kumal, which again brings us to a sort of very uh, Middle Eastern kind of vibe that reminds me of Raiders of the Lost Ark sort of stuff. And we have Maul and Locke going to see Fred, a uh, Soon-type synthetic android. And again, why do all the Soon-type androids have the same haircut? I get that Data has the coolest look, uh, especially when he had that beard in that one episode. But like, come on, they, they change your haircut over like 800 years, my guy. Anywho, this guy was a lot of fun. I did enjoy seeing the synthetic. Uh, it was nice just seeing like a black market synthetic guy. It reminded me of the uh, black market Vulcan guy, the gangster Vulcan that we saw in Star Trek Picard season three, who I enjoyed and wanted to see much more of. Same for this guy. He gets killed rather quickly by Maul and Locke, but his dynamic is just a lot of fun. Him playing around with like knowing too much information, have a little bit of banter and talking about like syllables of Maul and Locke's name and calling it spicy was I just was nerdy and dorky and I I loved that and and seeing a soon type android in a different setup than like a Starfleet crew member was awesome but uh you said we don't get a lot of him and he is mostly seemingly there to uh not only uh be able to open this like puzzle box for uh Maul and Locke but also so that when he looks at the uh book uh that the uh, our Starfleet crew can also get that information from his data bank. That being said, when Book and Burnham do find him, I did like that Burnham said, let's contact his family, like considering the soon type android a person and worrying about his family. They didn't stop her from like stealing his body and doing like an autopsy uh, on him with uh, Stemmets and uh, Culber, but, uh, but still, I, I did appreciate the gesture. That being said, I also loved the moments where Stemmets was sort of looking at the Soon type android and thinking of Alton Soon and being like, oh, this guy left a legacy that lasted 800 years. I mean, he's still around today the, in some way, shape, or form. And kind of showing that he wants 
that to a degree for himself. Uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, affinity that Stemmets had for uh, the Soontep android. But again, they use this as an opportunity to sort of get images of the book that the android was looking at. This all leads to the second big action sequence of the episode that, again, I have a lot of criticisms of, which is uh, Rainer, Burnham, and Book get on motorcycles, or space motorcycles, whatever the hell you want to call them, and ride across the desert after Mal and Locke, who also get into their ship. And again, I can break this down beat by beat, but uh, my biggest issue with it is, it is very clear that these characters on a green screen, sort of standing there, like, even their hair isn't whipping by them, like, I wish they had gotten a bigger fan for them, because, like, if you look at some shots, like, their hair isn't really blowing all that much, despite them supposedly racing by. So there was that little element of it where I could clearly tell that this was on a stage. But also, even more importantly to me, is that this, this sequence requires a lot of our knowledge of the geography, that there's this wall of rock ahead of them, the, uh, the town is behind them, the ship is sort of in between that they're trying to stop, and we also have the ships in space above. And the sequence never really gives us a good sense of the geography. We just get, again, a lot of narration from our characters that say like, oh, we need to stop them from going through the cave system. Oh, we can shoot down from above uh, and prevent them from going there. Oh, look, they, they also blew it up and now we have to go back the other way to prevent ourselves from dying, but also stop the town from getting blown up. And they, these are a lot of beats that are told to us, but the camera really never gives a great sense of scale nor a sense of geography of where I, I again, I know they're kind of in a straight line. I'm not like completely out of the loop, but it's just, I, I never get fully invested in what's happening because I just never get a sense of the scale of everything. Even at the end of the episode where conceptually I really love the idea of these starships coming down and preventing this wall of rock from destroying this entire town. I think that's a really cool idea, but we never get a sense of scale of it. It's just, uh, we see it from pullback and we see the ships like coming down in like sort of wide shots. Um, and like these are supposedly huge ships coming down to near this planet to prevent this wall of rock and wouldn't have been much cooler if we had gotten like a shot from the point of view of like Burnham or Book looking up at the starships coming down but we never really get that it's always distance and off to the side and so it, it just again I, I never feel fully invested in what's happening and I think I, I don't know there's just a part of me that would have loved to see like Burnham and Book like trying to drive underneath as they look up and they see these starships coming down on them just, just barely missing them like that would have been so cool and we don't really get that and again it just it's just a lot of like telling us what's happening and the characters narrating all the techno babble stuff without really getting a chance to uh really get like fully in like enthralled in the action and that being said, I do love the banter between Book and Burnham as they sort of work out their relationship issues. Again, I also love Rainer being in in the middle of this where being like, did I interrupt something that he said earlier in the episode? Again, giving him a little bit of charm despite his assholery. And I love him being kind of pissed off that they uh, that they didn't take his advice to stop Maul and Locke and him caring more about getting them than saving the, uh, the townspeople. And I also really love Book and Burnham sort of coming to terms at the end that they haven't, that they both are sort of at fault for not contacting each other and them still needing to work it out in the, in the long run. And that maybe their relationship is in some sort of jeopardy because they may not fit together anymore considering how much they've been on the outs. I'm pulling for you too. I'm pulling for you too, okay? I hope these, I hope these beautiful people work it out. We then have an adorable sequence with Saru and Turin where Saru sort of says, look, life is but a blink and I, I, I saw this moment of vulnerability and mortality for these townspeople uh, and I, I realized that while Discovery is also my family, I care deeply about you and I want to resign uh, from Starfleet to be near you because I think I should take into account um, my emotions, not just consider it from pure, purely uh, professional aspect. And Turin seemingly being moved by this in a very Vulcan way and asking Saru to marry her, which was adorable. And oh my God, we're gonna get a little wedding. I, I assume that maybe it'll come earlier, but um, I assume it'll probably come in like the season finale and we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a little Vulcan Kelpian wedding. I'm, a, I'm so happy. It's so adorable. It was so cute. So happy and excited for that development. But this leads to the final bit of the episode where Burnham goes and confronts Kovich, says she has more information about where they need to go next. They're looking for a different star system than Kovich thinks with a twin uh, twin moon, I believe is what it was, not twin stars. And uh, then her using this to leverage getting more information out of Kovich. And we learn that the Romulan that Tilly and Vance had found the hologram of earlier on in the episode during the whole uh, infiltration sequence was one of the Romulans from the episode The Chase, which those 
of you who don't remember, was a Star Trek The Next Generation episode from later on in the series, on I think either season five or six, I forget exactly which season, where we met the progenitors, the species that seeded life across the galaxy, and that explains why in the Star Trek universe so many alien life forms look like humans. It's a, it's a very weird episode, but it does kind of have a very similar flavor to what this season is seemingly trying to go for, which is a bunch of different alien groups trying to get this information uh, before anyone else does. So I think that's an interesting uh, episode to base this season off of uh, in a flavor wise. Uh, on a lore level thing, it's just one of those weird things that like Star Trek doing wonky stuff with evolution. Like it does explain why uh, so many aliens look like humanoids, but it's one of those, uh, it relies on that uh, theory of like, oh, there is one evolutionary plan for us all uh, that Star Trek sometimes leans into. And while this episode of uh, The Chase does do it better than most in that it's like given some sort of intentionality, uh, it does still rely on that like plan for evolution nonsense that Star Trek sometimes uh, misunderstands evolution to be. Like apparently we're all supposed to evolve into weird warp 10 salamanders, sex salamanders, as Star Trek Voyager's episode Threshold says. So yeah, it's just a weird episode, wonky episode on those terms, but a fun and interesting one to base off of our season on. And uh, also I like this idea that they're trying to stop people from getting this technology to create life. So that's an interesting sort of treasure hunt for our characters to be going on. I'm excited to see how that's going to develop over the season and is a fun, nice tie-in to Star Trek past uh, to uh, create a structure for our final season of Discovery. So overall, like I said, while I did have issues with some of the action beats this episode, the character interactions, the story setup, and our antagonists are all great basis for the season going forward. I am very pumped for this season, but I'd love to hear all your thoughts down below. What did you think of the season premiere of Star Trek Discovery Season 5? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you want my review of the second episode of this two-episode premiere, I will have that episode out in just a few hours after this one. But beyond all of that, thank you, my friends, for watching, and I hope you all live long and prosper.